security and needing that attachment. So when with Pippen not being there, he was the next dog up. So he became Jordan's little brother, however you want to put it. I think that gave him confidence and gave him like purpose. And as soon as Scotty came back, I think he kind of lost that. Go ahead, Nicole. <laughs> oh, just uh, agreed. You know, I piggyback on what he said. Uh, you know, when Scotty was out, he felt like Jordan needed him. He needed to be that number two guy. You know, being in Detroit all those years, he was never number two. He was never number three, never no really number four. But he played his role well. So when he came to Chicago and got that opportunity to be that number two player, right. he, he, you know, he, he showed who the real Dennis Rodman was. And he loved Michael needing him. So I think that would, you know, that was that was huge for him. He needed that to persevere for the rest of the season. So, yeah. Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, um, I'm just going to echo the same sentiment. He j I feel like he just needed to feel needed. Like um, like the guys just said, um, gave him a sense of sense of purpose. Uh, you know, and and he even said it himself, you know, when Scotty came back, they were back to being the three amigos, and he kind of felt like he was the third wheel, you know. And um, and as so someone with a as fragile a psyche as Robin appeared to have, I could see how that could um, – you know, I could throw them off a little bit, but um, again, you know, they they found a way to make it work. Ray Wilson. Yeah, um, I love how they explained it a little bit because you know, Rodman is one of those guys where a lot of people easily just gloss over the outside and the antics and everything else, and completely ignore, you know, uh, this Savani was from a basketball standpoint. I love that they took the time to talk about how sharp he was mentally, and that's how you can make up for Scotty not being there. Um, because, yeah, obviously they're not the same player, but mentally you arguably had three of the sharpest dudes in the game out there. Hmm. So, yeah, you're down one. That's how you can make up for, you know, that's how uh, Dennis could, uh, how he effectively filled Scotty's role by being himself because um, he could do oh so many different things. And uh, I want to move on to this part. One of the best segments of episode three was Dennis Rodman really explaining his science behind defending and rebounding which a lot of people who quote unquote think they know basketball don't understand. Um, we're going to start with you, Coach, uh, as far as, you know, him, just him looking at different players, how the, how the ball spins coming off their hand, how he needs, which makes him understand where I need to go to try to get the rebound, the defensive taxes, the tendencies. Because most people think defense is just, you know, just hustling and, uh, you know, acting out. I'm like, nah, it's a science behind it. You could do all that. But if you don't understand angles and tendencies of players, you still won't get cooked. You know, you're a, you're a willing guy to defend. So yeah. just break that down, seeing that, Coach. Oh, it, you know, it, 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 it was beautiful to watch. It was beautiful to see him explain that because you, you, you saw the Dennis Rodman that we all saw from the outside. You know, you didn't know what kind of player he was, but it showed how brilliant he was you know he studied every player he understood the angles of the rebounders he, he would you know bring somebody in to have him shoot jump shots so he could figure out the angles of the shot and he studied the guys rotations I mean he, this is brilliance you know this is new level brilliance that honestly has never been broken down in any segment that we've seen today obviously you know we have more access to players today and Name another player. I can't recall, but Cardell, you, I mean, you and Wilson, you know, doing this. Can you name another player that's ever broken down something like this? And this was 20-some-odd years ago when he broke it down. And I so, even and, 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 not even just that, just working on it, getting his friends. Oh, exactly, like exactly. So he can learn how to run down rebounds and, like, oh, it, jumpers. Like, that was – I was like, see. It, it was beautiful. People who, who know how to rebound, the you know, the Bill Russells, the Charles Barkleys of the world – I would love to hear them break it down because that was something that in all my years, I've never heard of a player breaking it down like that. So to show that he wasn't obviously, you know, seven games where he had 20 rebounds and no points, you know, I mean, you have to be just an animal out there to understand your role and perfect your role. Defense matters. Defense well, wins championships. I mean, and, and I think everyone kind of touched on it. I got you because it's the only people I'm going to try to go around make sure we, I got okay. you. Uh, go ahead, Wilson. Uh, no, nah, I mean, it was – I mean, you read stuff like that. I remember reading stuff like that around that time. Um, so, yeah, I was a nerd. That's fine. Uh, so, like, it's not new hearing that. But 
I'm happy that a lot of people get to hear it because of the platform it's on. Also, everyone's stuck in the house. You can't miss it. Like, that was me going on my way to go read that and find out about it. And again, like, to be great at something, like, is an example of how detailed you have to be. Like, that's that level of detail. It, it's epitomizes greatness. Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, and um, like your your initial statement, Cardell, like it's a science behind it, you know, and people just, you know, think it's just go out there, play hard, run around, and do all that. Nah, like you said, if you if you run out around without a purpose, you will get cooked. But um, yeah, like and like Wilson, um, that's that's something I heard before, like and I heard Isaiah Thomas ex- um tell a story one time about how uh, you know, Robin would just sit around and watch during shoot around. And he was studying the guy's shots, you know, seeing how they were missed. So he would know, like, where to go to get the rebounds. Like, he would know how many times the ball would rotate by the time it got to the rim of everybody on the team. Like, that's that's nuts. And just to have that type of, you know, that type of mind to even come up with that concept. Like, and Coach brought up Charles Barkley. Like, one time Charles Barkley was asked, you know, what's the technique behind rebounding? He just simply said it's to go get the damn ball. And that's the stark opposite of what we saw with Robin. And, and like, another thing, like, if you watch the highlights, a lot of times when Robin would get rebounds, he would go up amongst the crowd and tip the ball to a place where no one was, and then he would go get it. Like, that's a technique I, I don't think I've ever seen anybody else use. And he did it pretty much, like, every, almost every rebound he got. Like, rarely he's just going up and muscling the ball in, in the group. So, I mean, it, it just shows what type of tactician he was, how smart he was, and it's just a level of detail that very few people have. That's why he's pretty much in a class with maybe two or three other players as far as rebounding goes. Go ahead on that. No, I think that's up and other guys that have broken down rebounding and the angles and watching players shoot and how it comes off. I've heard other guys talk about it. I think Moses talked about it once. Even I think Barkley talked about it once, but not to this detail. Mm-hmm. But what I really liked about the episode was a lot of people just think Robin just played hard and wasn't intelligent. And this kind of proved the opposite for the for the layman's and for the novice basketball fans out there that didn't really know that he really studied the game. Like one part I liked was when he showed him watching film with the notebook and taking notes on players' weaknesses and strengths defensively, how to guard them. And like I said, I don't think people really understand that attention to detail to be great at whatever role you're in. So I really appreciated that. And just to add on what y'all was saying, Rodman was special on the defense, man, because he was literally the only player I could think of that could guard Magic, Mike, Bird, Malone, Barkley, Shaq, LaJuan, Dream, and you're cool with it. You'd be like, you can go ahead. If he get rocking, we'll send it double, but we're going to leave in the single coverage. You're not doing that with nobody else on those guys. And still go get you 20 boards. I mean, he, he he's a unique talent. And that's why for me, all the time, I'm, a, I'm, I'm always looking for him. You know, as I get Mike, I'm going to try to get him, you know what I'm saying, because he brings so much. And he's a perfect example of offense is cool, is a, is a major part. But if you're dominant on the other end, you're just as equally as, as important as somebody getting 30. And um, people need to understand that uh, this, this, this should be fun. Uh, seeing the physicality of the 80s compared to now. Uh, <laughs> we going to start with you, Wilson. Just, <laughs> you know, guys having to play through that, man, especially uh, the boys with the bad boys. Um, you know, what were your thoughts on that? <laughs> um, I mean, clearly it's different. Uh, you see what a lot of guys, you know, today, like what they deem adversity is why a lot of, you know, uh, or the physicality, what they make feel is like, you know, we laugh about what some flagrants are these days and, we get told about, you know, how bigger, faster, stronger everybody is. That's fine with science and technology, and that's great. But what you're leaving out of that, that, that discussion, and it's a big thing that's being left out of context, they were trying and allowed to take your head off. So I don't care if you walk around today lifting a bunch of weights or whatever. It's a different type of security in your head knowing they can't do that. Then they could. It was fine. The ref was looking at you like, well, you chose to go to the paint. What you want me to do about it? That was your choice. You could have stopped anywhere between the three-point line, half court, and the foul line. You went past the foul line, that's on you. I wouldn't go down there, that's on you. So, you know, like today's players, I guess, you know, like, and that's why at times, I was trying to find a nice way to say it, it's just comical. Like, 
obviously every area is a little bit different, but from a physicality standpoint, you're not allowed to touch anybody. Then like you legit had a set of rules where it was known, it was out in the open and okay. And showed up for every game and played all 82 with guys a little managing. I ain't even gonna go there. Go ahead, Ryan. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? uh, one, one, one thing that stood out to me was when um when John said when John Sally said um, you know, like, you know, we were taking to him, we were physical, and the refs weren't looking at Mike, making sure the savior was okay. Like, nah, you you if the whistle, <laughs> if the whistle don't blow, you get up, you keep playing. If the whistle does blow, all right, we call the foul. We don't want to hear you talking about it. Shoot your free throws or take the ball out. Like, that's that's just what it was. Like, the stuff – the game doesn't compare from a physicality standpoint between in and now. Let's, let's just be point blank about that. It doesn't compare. Like, if a person is facing you now, you can't even touch them. Like, and, and Mike put up 30 a game through that. Like, come on, man. And then, like Wilson said, from the mental standpoint of – if you know if you go down there what's going to happen to you and to keep going down there, that's a different type of animal. So, I mean, it's, it's just – it's really no comparison in that aspect of the game between then and now. Like, it's, it's just not – and anybody that tries to argue otherwise, just – I just won't engage with them. Go ahead, Arno. Well, um, one thing I think that Dennis Rodman said that I really liked was, like, he was willing to get hurt for a basket. He was that determined. He was that tough-minded that – he was doing anything, anything, everything, and anything to win the game. And I think they did a disservice by not saying how much Mike was getting. Because even throughout all that physicality, he was still getting 30, 40 point games. It wasn't like they were stopping him. Mm-hmm. It was just a hard 30, 40 points. Yeah. It wasn't like they were stopping him, shutting him down. And as for the physicality, like I think sometimes we get lost in the fact that you were allowed to do that. Not everyone played like the Pistons did in those eras, but you could. You know, and then like guys would fight and then go right back to playing. No text, no nothing. It's just a different era. I don't think a lot of players mentally could survive in that element. So that's why I think players that were great then in the 80s and 90s would be okay now because you can't, like, I can't get touched. Yeah. No one's clotheslining me. No yeah, one's no – They'd be like, what, what is this? Like, or, even, or even another thing, like, they would – what the Pistons would do, which they didn't mention, was one guy would foul you and there was another – you get penalized and someone else hit you after that. So now you got Robin hitting you, then Mahone hit, Mahorn hitting you. And then Robin, and then someone else hit you three times in the same play. Mm-hmm. That's tough to deal with. That's tough. Go ahead, coach. I mean, you know, just like everybody said, the, 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 the physicality of the game from yesteryear to today is night and day. We all know it. We all see it. Uh, you, you, you can't compare the two. Um, that's why it's almost comical when, you know, they say, well, guys from back in the day couldn't play in this era. Okay, you know, like, okay, they might not want to play in this era because of a lack of physicality, but trust me, they could play in this era. You know, the mentality of the game uh, to, to have someone knowing that you're going to get beat every single play, especially if you're one of those elite players, you're going to feel it after the game. You know, you see a lot of these guys, you know, the ice baths and all that stuff that they need. Think about what they went through back then without the technology that they have now. You know, we can we can say like LeBron, he says he spends a million dollars a year on his body. You know, that's 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 good. But could you have done that back in the day? And I'm sure LeBron could have. But I'm talking about some of the other players, in, you know, today's game. It's just a different mental aspect of the game. Can you handle that pressure? Can you handle that pain? And you can see where they you know, the Pistons started to respect the Bulls because when they came back that that next year, you know, it was no whining. It was no crying to the officials like someone had mentioned before. It was, okay, you know, we're going we're gonna to dish it back to you guys. And, and you see the levels that they, you know, they went to after that. And, and which I was kind of elaborated on all of y'all. Y'all said the mental aspect. See, you physically you can see that maybe somebody has the physicality to endure that. But mentally, you don't know until you actually go through it. It's like mm-hmm. you growing up playing ball, you in the suburbs, but you go to the hood. You don't know until you on a playground getting knocked beat up, and then you got to still play. You don't know, and, and no one knows until you go through that. That's why it's just like I mean, a lot some players you you can kind of you can kind of figure out you know, you know today Patrick Beverly's guys like that that you know are down for that type of play. But overall, the majority of the league you you don't know until they they go through it, and that's why that mental edge I always get to the former eras because they had to endure more to get success compared to today. So. 
Um, it was just good to see that. I'm glad they ain't leave that out. Uh, what about when Doug Collins took over and, you know, how Jordan kind of made his first impression in New York saying, you know, relax, coach, I'm not going to let you lose your first game and went out and dominated and won the game. Just talk about that experience, especially we got, you know, two coaches up here. Um, well, you know, go ahead and start, Raymond. We ain't start with you yet. Go ahead. Um, you know, that that just kind of gave another peek into just how savage Mike was. Like, and then um, to just to kind of backtrack a little bit with the um, with the Cleveland series, when, uh, when, you know, when the guy was talking about all the writers had, you know, pretty much buried him and he went to each one, you know, the guy that said they was going to get swept, we took care of you. Then the guy that said losing four, took care of you. Then the guy that said Cleveland and five, we going to take care of you tonight. You know, Mike, Mike was a promise deliverer. <laughs> and it's just <laughs> plain and simple, man. <laughs> like, it's just, you know, it's just like for, for him to, to have that, that type of mentality, like even it started from when he first got there, you know, like they touched on the episodes one and two, like that was a losing culture. And he said in his third game going against the Bucks, the team had their heads down at the end of the third quarter. He says, no, the game's not over yet. You know, and that continued throughout his career. And that, and, and with Doug's first game, same thing, you know, they playing against a, a really good New York team. You know, even Doug Collins himself had doubts. He said, relax, coach, I got this. And he went out and made good on it. And that, and that's pretty much who Mike was. Go ahead, Arno. I like how this whole documentary, just in general, is reminding everyone how much of a beast and how competitive he really was. Because I think because we have this out of sight, out of mind thing going on in society, when you don't see somebody for a while, you just forget how great they were and how competitive they were. And just how he was, he's not going to say die. He's not going to say die. And I can't stay up for a lot of the great players now. It's a handful of them, but not many of them were. And just a little adversity, they're already given up. And Mike, I think, thrived through that and found a way to push through it. Even with the media, like how many times you see guys getting all sensitive and upset with the media saying things about that. Mike would use that for motivation and then throw it back in their face. Mm -hmm. You know, so I did, his approach, his style of play, his mentality was just different than any other player I've ever seen play. I can't speak for anyone be before that. Everyone after, like, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and do that. The, the classic debate that's going on, but I don't think they, it's a comparison at all. And the closest person to him rests in peace. Even yeah. he didn't have mm -hmm. it like Mike did. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Coach. You know, I, when, you, when you talk about Doug Collins, you know, first of all, you know, you know, Michael respected him. You got to remember that he was a player, you know, he was a hard nosed player, you know, Doug could, Doug could play. Um, so he, he, he respected him. And, and and Doug realized that, you know, hey, I have a gym here. I have somebody special. And, and and if you remember what he said, he's like, hey, during my tenure, you know, he was the MVP, yeah. <laughs> the defensive player of the year, the all-star MVP, you know, and, and it was something else. He was a yeah, slam dunk the champion as well. Yeah, 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 the, yeah, slam dunk. He was all four things. Yeah, he, he, yeah, he was everything. And Doug made sure that to, to put that out there. You know, he, you could see a little <laughs> – you, you could tell it was a little saucy. But I, but I, I loved it because, Cardell, you, you you know me well. You know, I coached hard like Doug coach. Uh, you know, shirt sweaty, you know, suits a little stay, you know. So uh, I, really I, the game. Oh, goodness. So, I, I, yeah, so I, I, I absolutely loved his passion, man. So uh, – you know, and I, and I and I think you know that, that one. You know, the Cleveland, the shot. You know, yeah. which you know, to me, honestly, I know everybody has their favorite. I don't see how anything that MJ has ever done, any shot he's taken, was better than that. I'm sorry. You know, I think that shot right there, everything about it. You know, the the you know, I make the shot. You know, Craig Elo with the inbounds pass to you know score, and then to come back and do it again. Oh, yeah. everything the le the levels of that the last twenty seconds of that game. I don't think there's anything better. Honestly, I don't in MJ's career. You know, and I, I know that's uh, you know hard to say, but oh, the celebration, Doug Collins' celebration, it was a beautiful thing to watch, man. Goodness gracious! So, sure. on you, Wilson. Yeah, um, this is another example, another trip into the mind of a, a killer. Yeah, <laughs> like that. That's all it was for me. It was just something that simple and. You know, that was one of those things. And I love that Doug throw them numbers up there. Like, yeah, this is what happened. He told me, I, you know, he told me I, he was a killer. I understood that. Here's the ball, sir. Let's boogie. And, yeah, like, that's all it was for me. Just, John Wick. That's why I call yeah, him. Yeah, <laughs> legit. 
him telling him that was when he found out they took the dog. That's it. That's it was just the very beginning of it. He ain't even find the dude's name yet. Just that the dog's the dog's gone. Mm-hmm. Like that's it. So yeah, it wasn't anything more than that for me. I'm just I'm just excited. Like you, you know, Cardell, we all the VHS tapes, all that stuff. Like this isn't nothing new. I was laughing because like ironically, some of the footage you sent me tonight, like not only were they from like the VHS tapes, but they legitimately played in sequential order at times. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, man, it was just a little trip into a mind of a, a killer. That's, that's it. Yeah. We're going to stay on that killer theme. Uh, and Coach, you appreciate this because uh, the practices y'all used to make us go through, being extra physical, no fouls, no out of bounds, literally tackling to each other, bringing overseas guys to practice, no water breaks for three hours. Like our practices were tough. But the practices were tough with Jordan, and Jordan loved it. Like, Doug Collins were purposely stacked the deck to get him ready to play against a stacked deck in games. And Jordan loved it, whereas you kind of see a lot more players today complaining about having the odds against them, you know, you know, summertime, getting double teamed. They complain double about that. It's like, come on, so, you know, and he like, yeah, I love it. Keep it coming. Is that prepared him for the games when he had to go against all, the entire squad at times? Uh, we're going to start with Arnell, though. But, Arnell, what, what was your thoughts when you heard that from Mike? Heard what part? The part when he said Doug Collins stacked the deck against him in practice, and he loved well, it. That's why, I actually, that's, that's why I wanted to jump back in. Like, Doug Collins doesn't get his due with the development of not just Michael Jordan, but the team's progression. Like, everyone does this, but well, Mike didn't make it out the first round until Scottie Pippen got there. Scotty was a role player on that team. And he wasn't that good. Man. Like, he, was, he wasn't there yet. Yeah. Doug was what made was started making Mike into that killer because he recognized because he played with killers so he recognized what was in front of him and he got him ready and Mike respected him for that so I think that's what gets lost and also in the Cleveland win like people forget that Cleveland team is really good mm. Mark Price yeah. Ron Harper Lant, <laughs> Larry Nance Hart, like Hot Rod like wasn't that was a, that was a Cupcake was City that was a really good team they don't have injuries. Yeah, if they didn't have injuries, who knows, you know? Yeah. You could play that game. But um, just like he – like I said, he was a killer. He came with it every night. He knew he was going to give you – and like I said, I can't say that for a lot of players now. You know, <laughs> and he was also very coachable. Yeah. He wanted to be challenged. He wanted to be pushed. He didn't complain about that. Like, he wasn't happy when Doug got the ax, but he understood that maybe Phil was the next progressor for them to beat the Pistons. Go ahead, Coach. I think sometimes you have to give those players, you know, who those special players challenges. You know, you can't give them the same challenges as everybody else. You know, I mean, it, it's it's life. You know, you you have your you have your superstars, you have your stars, and then you have your role players. You know, so those guys needs to be pushed in different ways that you just can't push everybody. So Doug realized it. He understood it. He said, you know what? Hey, I have to give this guy a different challenge every day and he and he and he showed him and, and and like you know Arnell said look what he made he created Jordan was there but he unleashed a killer you know so would the bulls of the Phil Jackson era would they have been ready if Doug Collins didn't instill in Jordan that hunger that desire that that you know he had it but you know what I'm saying that extra motivation to say hey you know when the chips are down you know, I'm going to stack the deck a little bit even harder on you mm-hmm. and see what you can do. Can you bring us out of it? And he could. So, hey, you know, Doug Collins, hey, heck of a coach. And you see, as you can see, he came back. Michael trusted him so much that he came back and coached the Wizards, you know, when, when he was here in D.C. So, you know, he 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 loved, he loved Doug Collins. And, and Doug Collins loved him and it showed. Like y'all both said, and Doug Collins knew what he saw because he played with the in prime Dr. J. So he knew yes. he knew when like, all right, this, this dude was the next evolution of that. We can't hold him back. You know what yep. I'm saying? Right now, we gotta let him. And keep in mind, he might averaging 37, 8, and 8, three steals, two blocks, 50% shooting. It was like his third year in the league. You know what I'm saying? Like it, it's ridiculous where now it's like third year, oh, he's still developing. He was the MVP of the league. In his third year, like, it, it was it was no adjustment. It, it's just ridiculous how quick he came on to be that the best player in the game. Yeah. Imagine a bird in their prize winning championship. Hands down. Hands so, down the best. Yeah, it was no, dis- it was no dispute in that. So you got to give credit to Doug with that. Um, go ahead, Wilson. Uh, yeah, uh, I came with Doug did 
Doug was like the dude, uh, you know, the part of superhero movies, like the origin movies, where you got the little person hyping them up, try to figure out like the boundaries of their powers. Yeah. That was essentially what Doug was for him. That's a good one. Uh, That's good. I like that. I was just like, like, how tough can we make it? How fast can you go? How far can you jump? And then, you know, by the time you stretched out, you know, exactly the range of his powers, and obviously he wasn't fully complete, from that fulfill it, it, it was just the mental, it's, it's building on the mental. But like you found out just purely off pure power, how much of an impact he had. And like you guys have said, it, it, it was year three. You're not supposed to be doing, you're not supposed to be sniffing any of those things in year three. We legitimately nowadays give people like seven years because they don't spend enough time in school. They barely have on the way up. They usually don't listen when they get there, or if they get there, the organizations are so bad, there's no vets. Cardell, you, 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 you and I talk about that all the time. So that stunts their growth a little bit. So it was like a seven-year window. That's year three in that type of league. Yeah, man, it was just some superhero stuff. Yeah. Go ahead, Ryan. Um, one of the most important things, uh, I think Arnell touched on it, was how coachable Mike was. Like, even with that level of talent and – just being head and shoulders above everybody, he's still willing to accept direction. And, you know, he was, he had the confidence in Doug to just go, go what he said. Like, I trust that this guy's going to make me better. Like that's, you know, you, you're playing on a team, then you get switched in the middle of the scrimmage to the losing side. It's not, dag, why he switched me? It's all right, now let me still go win, you know? So that just like Wilson said, just going into the mind of a killer and, um, you know, and I know, like you said earlier, Doug don't get his credit. You know, he was there for a, a, a short stint, but it was very important in uh in Mike's evolution and the Bulls just in general. And let's just keep it a buck. Jerry Cross was going to fail to take his job. That's why he he touched on it, but he didn't want to sound bad. Anytime you just randomly bring an assistant in and it ain't really this guy, you know what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? So he was – he was gearing that up for that. So, you know, I'm glad, you know, Doug ain't fall for the baby. He's just like, I know what it was. I don't, don't think I'm stupid. But uh, the hate for the Pistons, the rivalry, man. Like, today they hype stuff up to be rivalries now. And it's not nah, – they they got a little fisticuffs, if you want to say, you know, in the game. It ain't hate. Like, this hate. Like, to this day, they just like, if I see you, it's on site. You know, you even hear it going back and forth before this with Pippen when he worked on ESPN and Isaiah may say a comment. He's like, man, I don't even want to hear what that dude got. It's, it's just personal, man. So, you know, just talk about that, the, a true rivalry with them, not just the back and forth physicality, but with those two teams battling for championships and being in the same division. Like he said, people don't remember, you had to see dudes six times in your division back then. So by the time you get to the playoffs, you're already tired. And I was like, man, you do one more thing, it's on. And, and then you add in the physicality, the playoff intensity. You know, Coach, just talk about what the, you know, talk about the hate for the Pistons and, and, and what you took from it. You know, when you have those rivalries like you were talking about, you know, the Pistons went through it with, with Boston, those great Boston teams. Um, obviously, we, we all remember the, you know, the Lakers and Celtics, but obviously they only met in the finals. Uh, when you have a, <laughs> a rivalry of that, you know, magnitude, and we're not just talking about just low level. We're talking about the highest of the high, you know, always meeting in the conference finals. Um, you know, those, those are, those are sweet. And, 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 and we don't like you, you don't like us. You saw the, the, the pain that was still on Isaiah's face when he talked about it. You saw Jordan talking about him, you know, <laughs> Hey, they just didn't like each other. It was just real basketball. That's, that's what we grew up on. That's what, you know, I grew up on, you know. I know I'm a little bit older than you guys, but, you know, that's that's what we grew up on. You know, I didn't like you. You didn't like me. Yeah, we could be cool when we were on the all-star teams and all of this. But, you know, when we're in between those lines, hey, we're going at it, you know. And that, that's what I love and that's what I respect, you know. So, so those teams of yesteryear, you know, it's a beautiful thing to watch, man. So, <laughs> You know, I give him I give him all the credit in the world. You know, I'm not I'm not with this, you know, hey, let's stack the deck, let's 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 go work out together, you know. Uh, that that Giannis type of, you know, new that new blood in a in a in an old type of way. You know, I love it. I love it. You know, I wanna see guys compete at the highest levels, you know. So that's why this actually this season was 
you know, going pretty well because you didn't have, you know, the stacked team. So, you know, good stuff. Good stuff. Beautiful to watch. Go ahead, Wilson. Uh, yeah, man, it was a – there's levels to everything. And they showed us the levels between dislike, <laughs> um, respect, <laughs> and pure, unadulterated hatred. Yes, indeed. And the level – like, what I liked is – they really got into just how personal it was. Like you saw, you know, remember last week, everyone was like, well, you know, everyone was like, well, Mike went golfing with Angel, whatever. Yeah, that's cool. The Celtics and Bulls didn't hate each other like the Pistons and Bulls did. Mm -hmm. No one had beef. Like that was a that was a certain level of I can't stand your you know what guts. I don't like your existence, the way you breathe, just seeing you. It it bothered them that much about each other and that's what made it that great. The other thing is like low key throughout that hatred is there was kind of a sense of the Pistons understood that how talented those young guys were, that that duo was right there in that group and the Bulls where we had to conduct business like this. Otherwise that happens. They, otherwise they don't hold them off as long. Right. You know what I'm saying? Just to be honest, like then, you know, instead of it being three or four years, man, that's accelerated. They run to buy them dudes if you, if you can't beat them up and you're letting them just be the pure, crazy athletes they are. Are the Pistons winning two chips? If they don't, you know, if that's not the way they went about their business to hold them two off? No, because because they couldn't start Mike. It was just that simple. Nobody in the league can start Mike. And this is what they haven't touched on. I'm glad Kenny Smith said, and I had to post it on, so, on, on my social media pages. They put in an illegal offense after this 37 point game, I mean, 37 point a game year. Illegal offense. Like, who ever heard of something like that? Like, he said, I didn't, and obviously he was coming in the league, so he, he, he had to know. But I never even heard of that. It's just like, basically, you can't move everybody to the other side and ISO Jordan. That was illegal now because they couldn't stop him. They said it was bad for basketball. It wasn't team basketball. So, and he still came back and averaged like 35 the next year. We were taking that up. You see what I'm saying? Like, who? And Kenny said it best. He said, you know, he said, you can't be in a GOAT discussion if you, had, you haven't had a rule change. Only two other players had that, and that was Wilk and Jabbar. Now, everybody else and, and Mike came out, but that was it. And Mike is the only wing player. Those are footers. So he said, I ain't trying to hit none GOAT if you ain't had a rule change. Just Shaq later on, you know, Hackish, all that. You know, even AI to a certain extent, yeah, you can't do your crossover no more. Because, you, you know, it, it's just – when you really add that in, man, like, you really – come on, you're you going to stop this man because they can't guard him on offense? Like, all right, I, I hear what you're saying, but that – I mean, that's just crazy. Go ahead, Ryan. Oh, yeah, man, before you go, add in the other factors that made the rivalry intense because Isaiah and Bill Lambert from Illinois. They from, you know, Isaiah's from Chicago and Bill Lambert's from everybody. So then you got the guy in your hometown being the guy. Good point, yeah. Being the guy. Every time you come home, like, yeah, I mean, I want you to hoop, but – the Bulls got to win. I'm just sorry. You like you? Nah, it's on. All right, you gonna get tired of hearing that? Go ahead, Ryan. <laughs> no, I I love it, man. I love the fact they took it personal. Like uh, that's that's really what's missing now. Mm -hmm. Like guys, guys are just kind of okay with losing to certain guys. <laughs> like I don't. Where did that come from? Like when? <laughs> what part of the game is that? Like you, the the goal is to beat everybody. Like I that's. I, I love it, man. I, I would have I, – I wish I could have been a part of that. Yeah. You know, like, that's that's amazing, like, the, the intensity in those games. And then through all of that, they still spoke about Mike with a measure of respect. Mm -hmm. Through all the hate. And the Bulls vice versa for them. They, like, they ex push Exactly, them. yep. Through, through all that, nobody discredited anybody's game. Like, it's, it's the purest form of – athletic competition maybe I've ever seen. Go ahead, Arno. Well, I was going to say is um, about the rule. I know referees that say it was literally called the Michael Jordan rule, where you couldn't have four guys at the three-point line or four guys on the one side of the court and isolate. So that's how unstoppable he was. We can go into his whole skill. So I think one thing we forget about, we don't talk much about, is his pull-up jump shot, mm -hmm. which made him virtually unguardable. Mm -hmm. You think about him going to the rim, and the turnaround jump shot, but a lot of people don't talk about his off the dribble shooting ability. Um, but as for the rivalry, like the, the Pistons were the bullies on the block. No one really liked the Pistons at, at that time. Yeah. They're the bullies on the block, and these kids are standing up to them. The bully don't like when someone stands up to them, so what do you expect? 
especially when this team is consistently beating you and in your way for you to win championships and they're beating you up. So what, what was it, I should have been expected that they were going to have that type of rivalry, seeing each other three straight times in the playoffs and Mike going out the same way and then finally beating them and sweeping them. So I, I love the rivalry, like, because back then you had to earn it. You had to wait your turn and earn it. It was nothing was given mm-hmm. to you. And I think that's something that we don't have now today. We go all this free agency. Like, like I was seeing even three, four times ago, join so-and-so and went with them. And I think how many times during this documentary you heard a player say, I would play for free. Dennis Robinson said that loud and clear. Mm-hmm. So it was, the, the passion was different. So when your passion is different, your competitiveness is different. And that causes that emotion that we feed on during the game. So now players, like I said, they're cool with losing. I got my money. I got my endorsements. They don't care. Like to them, to these the guys in the 80s and 90s, the game was first. Everything else was secondary. Mm-hmm. Like, Jordan said, I would play for free. And then Rodman touched on, like, this is the playing is the easy part. It's the, the other bullshit we got to deal with. <laughs> yeah. You know? So I like when you said that, because that's how a lot of players felt during that day. Especially as like Larry Bird, they just enjoyed playing and competing and competing against the best and trying to prove that they were the best every night. Rather than the media or someone else raising them to this platform. I feel like back in the days, if your peers didn't respect the game, it didn't matter what the media was saying. And it's different now. And also, not to piggyback on what you're saying, I feel like the media back then was tougher. They didn't promote you until you mm-hmm. actually did something. You had to really earn it. Like, look what Jordan was doing. Are right, you still not Magic Bird? You ain't won nothing, dog. So, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you, man. You know, scoring champions don't win, don't win rings. So you want to change something up. Hey, Magic Bird, how you Forget doing? that. If you forget that part, that he was doubted and discredited over and over again until he finally won a championship. Well, you know, the kid, that. You, say, you know, he just came, he was just born and went to the league and won championships, but it, it's a, it was a it was a grind and to get there. And it reminded him. And that's what pushed them to become the greatest of all time, you know. And I think that's something that's missing today because now you 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 can basically wind your way into the all-star game even though your team is 20 wins and stuff. And it's just like, yo, hold on, where I'm from? There we grew up on, I ain't trying to hit you if you're in the lottery. I don't care what stats you put in. I'm already, you can hoop, good. But I feel like a lot of things just just are being catered to depending on your brand and who you associated with, with shoe brand and all that. Your game supposed to do all the talking, not not all the, the media campaigns, so to speak. And I feel like the media was tough on them. Like then they held you to the fire. And that's what Stephen A. talked about on ESPN when, he, you know, they try to pump young players. And they're like, hold on. And them old timers get at them like, nah, treat them the way y'all treated us when we were coming up. Don't give them a pass. We tired of this. And just and think about – Yeah, and think about what if guys back then were making $200 million on top of the intensity they have now. You see what I'm saying? Like, what if Mike would have got $200 million before Isaiah and Isaiah went in range? It would have made it even worse. It, it, you know what I'm saying? Like, oh, what? Like, they were jealous of Jordan because he had his own first brand <laughs> – with Nike coming in with the gold chain here, you know all that. So, I mean, it, it, it was it was it was it was real back then. Let's just say that um, they still throwing shade. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they still throwing shade. Yeah, for sure. The Jordan yeah, rule. The yeah, you, Jordan you had like like you said, Cardell. He he was six years into his you know into the NBA, and he was still you know getting hated on. You know, he he's not Magic. He's not Bird. He's not winning. He's a you know a solo guy. You know, this is after the, you know, not only did he do it on the offensive side with the MVP and the scoring championship, he was already a defensive player of the year as well. So he showed his total, you know, uh, game, you know, so it wasn't just one dimensional, but could he lead the team to a championship? That was always the question and the knock about him. So like you said, the media was much tough on Jordan and these, you know, guys today, you know, because you had to earn it. You literally had to go earn you know, your keep. So, and, 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 and the piggyback on, you know, what one of you guys said earlier that you're about the eighties, you know, the money that was being made. Remember a lot of those guys had other jobs as well in the summertime, you know, that, that money that they were making, except for the elite players, obviously, you know, some of those other players that, Hey, we got to make a, you know, uh, another, you know, earning, you know, we have to make more money. So, uh, it's just different, you know, it, it's, it's given a little bit too early nowadays, you know, than I like to see, so. And I like, and, and in this area, that kind of irritates me. They kind of discredit and water down standards. Like, now it's like, man, you know, championships are cool, but it's not the end-all, be-all of basketball. It's like, when? That's when that happened. That's what you're dominating for. So, 
but I still see guys um, when when it comes time to debates and stuff, they bring up championships to kind of separate players. So obviously it does matter. So I'm not understanding it, but they try to discredit everything because to me, when you try to discredit something, that means you can't measure up. Otherwise, it just be like, okay, I, I I feel you. I'm gonna try to meet meet that. That's why you always see um, Jordan when he won his first championship. He said, now I feel like I can kind of sit at the table with Larry and Bird. Even he felt like I'm not up there yet until I win, even though he's murdering the league. So hmm. what more do you want? But we're going to kind of stay on subject, go to the Jordan rules. Uh, what were your thoughts on a defense designated for a guy, basically to F him up, <laughs> to just keep him grounded so we can win? Go ahead, Wilson. I mean, it was the ultimate compliment, man. <laughs> you had a bunch of Hall of Famers talk about don't let the man lead the ground because once he leave, it's a wrap. Let that, like, let that settle in real quick. I love that Arnell talked about his, uh, you know, people gloss over the mid-range game and we love the turnaround, but the pull-up was so, his pull-up was so violent. Man. Like, it, it was violent. It, it was an act of aggression. Um, and a pull-up jumper is not supposed to be that, but that's what it was. It was legitimately an act of aggression of, I will elevate, there's nothing you can do about it, and take that. Like, I don't, ha- I don't have to come all the way down and give you that, but, like, even, you know, uh, Coach, you mentioned the shot over Elo. You know, in his head, you know, like, he was talking through it. He was like, yeah, I should have one dribble, whatever. The man had time for two dribbles and the pull-up going to his left. And then we heard a little bit later, you know, with the Jordan rules, one of the things they were saying was push him to his left. The shot he hit over Elo, he was going to his left. So, again, we heard in the first two episodes about how fundamentally sound he was. Like, it was his ultimate compliment. It was legit. Like I said a little bit earlier, outside of using those tactics, it was a it was a dub. It was done. If you just let that man boogie, he was going to get you out of there without everybody on his team being fully mature. It would have happened earlier. But I love what the Pistons did. And the other thing is, you know, we hear about a sports all the time. It's a copycat league and whatnot. Other teams try to do it, but like I was saying earlier about the mentality, you can't fake that. You can't manufacture that. Like, you can't be like, hey, I want you to channel your inner Rick Mahorn today. Nah, dog, you either Rick Mahorn or you're not. <laughs> Facts. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, you could watch 50,000 clips. That's what makes Rick Mahorn Rick. You know what I'm saying? That's what makes Dennis Dennis. Like, they called it, they, hey, take him out. Boom. Everybody's, how are you on a string to take somebody out? And I think it was you already know that measure. Like, it wasn't just a hit. It was like three layers of contact. It, yeah. It, it was the type of history, like, first you're like, I, I got fouled. Second is, damn, they're going to keep doing that. And three is like, do I still want to play, bro? Like, and if you get the four, it's like, is it worth it? Like, like, like for real? Um, just the ultimate level to – ultimate level of respect. And, again, all it did was do the psychopath, so it just unlocked another level of killer. Instead of being like, I'm good, I'm going home. Like, I love they showed the beginning of the Jordan rules, like what it was, the uh, the origins of it, and then we got to see the, what it uh, what it produced, which was, yeah. oh, I'm in a room now, I'm in a weight room now. Oh, now I'm gonna give out the punishments. So I want to touch on that. <laughs> when I leave the ground, y'all gonna feel me when I leave now. Now, now let's have fun and you know, extra gifted athlete throw some weight on them. That's a, that's a totally different mix right there. So. Yeah, it's, nah, that's all I got to say. And the nugget off the weight room thing is, my guy, she got that from Joe Dumas because he asked him after one of the lo- series losses, like the first two, he was just like, what are you, like, what are you doing all season, man? Like, I'm getting tired of y'all beating me up. And Joe Dumas, he, he, he made a mistake. He was like, oh, I left weights. <laughs> he said, I left weights. So Mike was like, oh, really? So that's when he looked into it. And then a little bit after that, and that's funny how God worked a little bit after that. That's when Tim Grover was trying to get on. He sent all – he he said he didn't even bother Mike. He just sent the note to the Bulls, all the other players, saying, if you want some training, I'm here. And Mike is the only one that called back. And, it, and he didn't even reach out to him because he just knew, like, Mike is already all world. I'm not even going to bother him. And Mike reached out to him to see. And next thing you know, they in the weight room getting ready with Tim Grover and the rest of the system. Go ahead, Raymond. Man, that – the whole Joe and Rules thing, that just speaks to Mike's greatness. Like, if, if the ultimate answer is to stop this guy, we got to step outside the confines of basketball. Like, that that just says it all right there. I mean, they had their little techniques. We're going to push him left. We're not going to let him go baseline. And if he catch the ball in a certain spot, we're going to double. 
But if all that don't work, we just go and knock the shit out of them. Like if for for the, for that to for that to be the answer, like come on, man. Like you you can't even. And he was still he was still getting his getting his numbers. Thirty one. Like so, what like? It's, it's just no stopping this guy. So you came up with a special set of rules that ultimately were against the rules, and you still couldn't stop him. So I, I don't I don't know where else to go from there. Like they they gonna play with six players next. I mean, what what more can you do? Like it's, it's like Wilson said, it's the ultimate compliment. Like we have to figure out a way to stop this guy. And then again, like the way they talk about him, once he gets in the air, it's over. Like name name another player that's been talked about that way. Like, and this is from people that hated this man, but they knew, like, man, we gotta if we get him on the ground, we got a shot. But once he plant that foot and take off, just go ahead and take the ball out. Like, it's just craziness. Go ahead on now. Like John Sally said, like, at times we didn't even know if he was human. So that is high praise in itself. You know, the Jordan rules, like, was just, I mean, what can you say about, him? like, how many players have had a rule just for them? And if you watch after game one, how Chuck Daly looked, you knew he was up to something because he was a great coach. It's mm-hmm. like, we just play regular basketball. This is not going to work. We're going home. Mm-hmm. They had to do something. And they took they, – they, this guy reported they took the elbows away so he couldn't pull up. They took the baseline away so he couldn't really get to his pull-up. They were kind of forced into the rim. And when you come to the basket, we're going to knock the shit out of you. And that's what they did. And despite that, he kept going to the basket. And every year – this is what I love about him. So putting the blame on his teammates, what can I do to make myself better, make my teammates better the next year? And then one year he went, you know what, we're going to lift weights. I'm going to buy into the triangle. Maybe me getting 30 and dominating the ball is not the best way to beat this team. And Phil Jackson told him that. And he bought into it. Like, maybe me getting the ball in different spots, in different areas where they can't just zone in on me and incorporate my teammates is the way to beat this team. So he was willing to always evolve and adjust and find a way to get it done. And once again, how many players in this common era, can, current era, can you say that for? I'm going to find some way to make the adjustment to evolve my game so I can win, because winning was the point. Like, he didn't care about the statistics. It was great. And he, w- he did that because he was a dominant player and he was trying to win. But he cared more about winning the game. So that's one thing I always loved about Michael's competitive spirit and the fact that I'm going to find a way. Y'all can keep putting the door in front of him. I'm going to find a way to get through that door. And that's what separates him from a lot of other great players, in my opinion. Go ahead, coach. You know, the. The Jordan rules, you know, I always say, you know, taking Mike out of the discussion, I always say that Kobe is the smartest player ever because he took Michael's blueprint and, you know, hey, didn't perfect him, but he was the closest ever to do it. Right. Uh, but the second the second team is, is Detroit because they prolonged their championship run because of the Jordan rules. Uh, you know, they, they, they made it tough. They made it tough as heck to, you know, for Jordan to be the Jordan. We're going to show you, you know, and it's a reason why they had a winning record against, you know, the Bulls, had a winning record against, you know, the Lakers, had a winning record against, you know, uh, Larry Bird and the Boston Celtics. You know, they were dogs, man. They were dogs. They understood – how to play defense. They, they, they accepted that role. You know what? If, 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 if this is the way it's going to take the win, hey, let's do it. It wasn't a foul back then. And even if it was, hey, we're going to keep doing it until, you know, hey, the, the opponent said, I give up. Jordan didn't give up. Jordan came back that next year, like Arnell was saying, that, you know, hey, what is it? We're going to lift weights now. We're going to make our team better. We're going to start dishing out, you know, the punishment instead of always getting it taken to us. So, you know, hey, what Detroit did is they made Jordan that much better. Mm -hmm. You know, you you see levels in Jordan's career, you know, speaking of Doug Collins unleashing that, you know, that killer, you know, there are levels to this. And Jordan had to go through all these levels. And they were, you know, Doug Collins, Detroit Pistons, you know, even taking it all the way back to Dean Smith. There are levels where, you know, hey, you saw the evolution of Jordan. And this was just another thing to get him through. If he didn't have the Detroit Pistons, who knows what Jordan would have been? 
who knows if Jordan would have been six and zero with six MVPs in a championship game because he wouldn't have known how to you know to get over that that hurdle. If it came a little bit too easy for him, hey, he might have been four and two in the final that you have to go through is that mercy that you have to go through to get to that exactly. next level and, and 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 Jordan saw it and Jordan needed it the whole Chicago team needed it you know Scotty needed it you know so Jordan you know Detroit the Jordan rules hey that was perfect for Jordan actually you made him the greatest player of all time like adversity builds you man and yes, a lot sir. of people these days I mean we could say it with the grassroots air all uh, all the way up to the, the NBA they don't like to endure as soon as it's a little adversity, I'm gone. I'm transferring. I'm out. And when we grew up, that was a sign of weakness. It was just like, oh, you don't believe me, coach? I'm going to show you. Just out of spite. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to make you play me. And that's the challenge. And that's totally been lost on this generation. And it, it, and it shows. Now they, they probably look at Jordan for being stupid or something like that. I mean, heck, even the front office, if that would have happened, you losing three years in a row now, the front office may have blown that up. Gone. Gone. Yeah. So – Hey man, it's just it's just a different time. Uh, we gonna go to the episode four, kind of get through this. We won't be too much longer. Um, Rob man saying he need a break and going to Vegas. Just, <laughs> I mean, if you was in Phil Jackson's shoes, how would you feel about that? How would you have navigated that? Honestly, go ahead, Ryan. We started off. <laughs> man, uh, that's that's an unfathomable situation. <laughs> like, if I'm a coach and a player comes to me in the middle of the season saying I need a vacation. No, no. <laughs> what are you? What are you talking about? <laughs> but I mean, that's that's just that's a special situation, and Robbins is a special person. <laughs> so I mean, uh, obviously they did the right thing because with, without without that, uh, that whole thing probably implodes right right than it did. So I mean, like Phil, Phil's called his master for a reason. But yeah, ahead, like if, oh, go ahead. Your no, I, I was done. All right, go ahead, Lionel. Well, I mean, as a player, you got to really understand and know your players on and off the court. But I think that's something that only works for the NBA. That's not something you're ever going to see in high school nah, or in college. Not that, man. That's 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 a whole two different type of ball game right there. Um, but Phil understood. I mean, the players trusted Phil, and they were able to be vulnerable and talk to him. So Phil knew something maybe that Michael didn't know during that meeting. He's like, no, let him get a little break, let him recharge. He was a mild citizen at that point, majority of the season. And it wound up working out. This, I mean, coaching is not just X and O's. It's not just your IQ. It's mm-hmm. understanding personality. It's, psycholo- it's a psychological side to it. And that's something that I was very good at, managing personalities and managing egos. You know, like we kind of overlooked that side of the coaching aspect, especially people that are novice to the game. Go ahead, Coach. <laughs> hey, <God. laughs> that's, a, that's, that's a funny question, man. I, like, I'm just imagining if you if you you were look you are a rebounding expert as well. So if you, if you came to me and said you need a break, hey, that, you know what? The question that I I, I have about that is uh, they didn't say how much did he miss games? Did he or was it just practice time? No, they. Just, they ain't that, gonna bash on. They all Mike said was like, "Nah, I ain't come back in forty hours. I had to go." Get yeah, it, it, but you you notice how, how that that a little it, it, it started the hours started going up when they, <laughs> so it was like, did, what did he miss? That's the, that's what I really want to know. Did he just miss practice, or Mike did he actually Mike. miss a game? That, that, that's a that's no, a, was right because he was like, like like Arnell. He's not coming back in 48 hours. Oh, yeah, he, he knew. He knew. He knew. He knew. And like, look, like Arnell said, you know, hey, you know, being a coach, you, you have to know the personalities of guys. You know, I've dealt with it before. You got to know, you know, who you can push, who you can, you know, who you got to relax a little bit. So, you know, you got to you gotta know them. You got to have that that psychology of, of the game, you know. It's almost like we had to take a class in psychology, you know, experts, you know, to learn these players because you have – 12 to 15 personalities on your team, you know, you got to know how to manage them all. So that was, <laughs> Phil knew that, you know what, we needed to give this guy a break. You know, like I said, hey, he was a model citizen up until that point. You, you know, let him go blow off some steam. Yeah, we thought it was going to be 48 hours, but next thing you know, knock, 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 it's MJ at the door. Let's go. <laughs> you know, you got to come back. That was, that was, <laughs> <laughs> that, that was funny to me that the, the star had to go to Vegas, knock on his door to go get him. Hey, Dennis well, was needed. 
Dennis was no yeah, doubt. But and I think uh I think Phil could relate to Dennis because he was robbing in his own right during the seventies with the Knicks. I mean they told the story my man took acid and <laughs> and was running down the street <laughs> roaring like a lion. I mean that means he he, he was high yeah. on his mind. So he he <laughs> He was a hippie, man. So he was wild like Dennis. Him and Dennis. He had his Robin moments. Man. So, I mean, you understand look, him better than anybody. Hey, so he knew, like, go ahead, give him a sign. He'll be back, you know what I'm saying? But, <laughs> man, if, he, if, if social media was around at all, man, go ahead, Wilson. Hey, how oh, man. Robin. <laughs> I don't know. Like, like many of you said, like, the biggest thing is, um, that's what made Phil feel, man. Um, a lot of times, like, especially, you know, in this microwave area, you know, we've seen some of these teams put together, whatever, and the first thing people do is, oh, man, it ain't hard to coach them. No, stupid. It's harder when the more talent you have. Thank you. It's harder to get people to be limited, but kind of a little bit less than to a degree, because everybody knows it's easy. Like, this is what I do. This is what you do. This is what you do. You get more people that could do 97,000 different things. It's hard to tell you, look, today, I need you to do 13 of them. You, I need you to do three of them. You, you can do what you want. You, mm -mm, cut all that out. That's a whole lot. Um, Cardell, I love you. You brought up, you know, Phil's playing days. I mean, it was almost, <laughs> God's <laughs> timing, right? Like, pretty much, because, like, for Dennis, we probably had to have somebody to kill legitimately be on us in terms of you know somebody running down the street um phil could um so i mean it worked and just kudos to phil and oh people just appreciate it. they took that part away from him that like you're able to think about the uh better lack of words the shit show the bulls were at that year right yeah. to manage and navigate through all those things so let's just props to phil for that and that's why I can never coach. That's that's for people with patience. Never do that. It's not that bad. Yo, it's not that bad. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. And I will never know, sir. <laughs> you won, but I was ready to beat up parents. It, it wasn't good. <laughs> um, text winner. Um, bringing in the triangle offense, which I, honestly, I know they say it made Mike unselfish, but to me, it unleashed Pippen, his all-around skill, which made the Bulls start to become what they eventually became. Uh, just just um, elaborate on that, man. We're going to start with you. Uh, go ahead, Wilson. Uh, yeah, I, 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 literally what you just said, that wasn't for Mike more so than it was for Pip. Um, it, and the big thing I took away from the night was, you know, Mike had that thing talking about, you know, Pip just needed to see somebody stand up for him, let him know that I'm, I'm right here to ride with you. Um, so it's like, you know, people today be like, oh, man, you know, there's only a certain way for some folks to consider people making people better. Um, there's also another thing where you instill confidence. It doesn't have to be through numbers. It could legitimately be through here, seating control. Um, you know, sometimes that means he's coming off the ball. Yeah, Mike had a stretch. You know, younger Mike, he could have played point guard. He could have brought the ball up. But again, to unleash Pip, to try and go help do all that, you know, Mike's going to be able to do whatever he needs to do, whatever he needs to do it. But to get the to get the whole team going, to un unlock that next level for Pip, it made things that much more dangerous for the Bulls as a whole. And shout out to Tex Winter because he never gets enough credit for for that and just for the mind that he had for the game um, outside of the triangle. Like, that was one of those pieces that was a part of that puzzle that, you know, you take that away, man. Are we here talking about all this? Like, it doesn't look the same without Tex bringing that to the table. Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, my biggest takeaway was um was getting uh, Scottie Pippen more involved into the whole situation because that, like you said, that was kind of the the missing ingredient that made them, you know, fully fully form like Voltron, so to speak. Um, yeah, like you know, Mike just going one on one every time was cool, but you know, it's it's harder to defend five guys than it is to defend one, no matter how how good that one guy is. So yeah, like bringing that into the fold and the whole team buying in, that 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 really pretty much made the Bulls un, unstoppable right there. And just, just to note, Mike scaled back his scoring and still got the highest career average and the most scoring titles. Just I just need people to think about that for a second. Like imagine if he just went crazy his whole career. 
And imagine if he was playing today in the ISO era. Like, come on, man. Like, but yeah, that that triangle was the that was that was the um, that was the missing piece for them, you know. And it, and it seemed to give uh, Scotty Pippen more confidence. Like he said, he um, he started out, you know, playing the point guard, but you know, when he had his growth spurt, he started moving more to the um, to the small forward position. But he still had those guard skills, and that allowed him, you know, to do everything that he was able to do, which you know made him and Mike the the best one-two punch ever. Go ahead on that. Well. I actually run some triangle offense with my teams. Um, I think it's a great offense because it makes everybody in the offense dangerous. You have to guard everybody. You have to pay attention to everybody. As for Jordan, I think it did help him. It made him a little bit more efficient, and he was getting the ball in different spots. He was playing more off the ball, so you couldn't really focus on him as much, especially in the Detroit Pistons series. It helped him out because now he was touching the ball. He was more engaged in the offense rather than watching Mike go off most nights. And it, but it also made the other players like Paxson, Grant, Craig, all those other players more dangerous. And more you had to you had to guard them now. You wasn't just watching the Michael Jordan show. And that's one of the things about the offense because all the ball movement and cutting and just reading off each other is not very predictable to guard. And it really forces the players to have to really connect with one another. And when they have that, when five guys connect on the court like that, you know how hard it is to guard them and stop. Them. I think that helped them tremendously. Shout out to Tex when it's, like, it's a brilliant offense when ran right with the right personnel, obviously. No doubt. Go ahead, Coach. You know, I know we all would like to give uh, credit to, you know, Phil Jackson for the triangle, but we all know it's Tex winners that, that, you know, instilled this offense. Um, but I honestly want to say, you know, it showed Mike's true leadership. You know, he was never really considered a leader until those years. And I think that's what really, you know, brought out the Bulls because you have a superstar at the prime of his his, his career, and now you're telling him, hey, we're going to change the offense to get other people involved. You know, what if Mike, you know, bucked at that system? You no, know, I don't want to do it. You know, would he still be a Chicago Bull? Would Phil still been a Chicago coach? You know, so it showed his leadership to say, you know what, okay. I'm going to believe in this system. You know what? I need Scotty Pippen. You know, I need the other players. So it showed Jordan's leadership more than anything to me. Obviously, you know, Pippen was coming, and he needed the triangle offense to show his offensive prowess. But it, the leadership that Jordan, you know, a, at the most critical times in championship basketball minutes, what did Jordan do? He gave the ball up. Paxson. You know, L.A. series, you know, uh, Phoenix, which I'm a Barkley diehard guy, you know, gave it up, you know. So his leadership to trust guys in the most critical, you know, moments of the game, that's what the triangle offense actually really brought to, you know, to, 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 to that era, you know, to say that, hey, the best player doesn't always have to, you know, be the one taking the, the most, you know, the critical shot. I can trust my teammates, give up the ball and say, hey, you guys earn it. Y'all are here. You know, be confident. It instilled that trust in them and say, you know what? Hey, if Jordan's believing in me, hey, all I got to do is go knock down the jumper. So. We got a couple more questions. Um, Then we're going to close this up. The one thing I took from it and one thing I've always argued, but you kind of saw it is um, it was always this misconception, especially with this era with these young fans saying Michael Jordan never made anyone better. I'm like, yes, he did. It was Scottie Pippen. <laughs> And you kind of saw oh, it's I mean, <laughs> the more so Scotty because Scotty became a top 50 player. And I'm like, you got to understand his growth. Like he came from a small NAIA school. And by the time he was in his fourth or fifth year, he's playing with the dream team. That's one of arguably the best small forward in the game. That's, that's development. That means, and then you kind of saw the details of how BJ explained that he got Pippen ready. Mike got Pippen ready because Pippen had all the athleticism and size, but he didn't have Michael's drive. And then when you're seeing the guy put that much work in, you have no choice but to do it. Otherwise, you, you're you the weak link. You can't just sit, sit around and be lazy. And obviously, what a lot of people don't know is, you know, he he started training with Jordan with Tim Grover, and then he got stronger and whatnot. So those are all in battling, battling each other in practice, guarding one another and stuff. That's why, you know, I hear the you know, talking heads who don't deserve to be mentioned saying, Jordan, I want to know what he would do in today's era with the wings, Kawhi, and all that. 
I'm like, he had pep in the practice every day. What are you talking about? Like, you know, get him alive. <laughs> can't touch him. Can't touch exactly. Him. Exactly. I ain't so basketball. He averaged 45 a game. Easy. You put up wilt numbers today. Exactly. You know, so, I mean, they got to find something, man. But just talk about how he developed, you know, Pippen in a sense. And developing Pippen made the Bulls eventually what they what they are, the dynasty. Um, go ahead and start with you, uh, Arnell. Well, once a, one thing, battling him every day in practice and taking him under the wing, which older players are supposed to do, is something we don't see in today's NBA, where the older dudes mentor the younger dudes to help them develop and show them the tricks and show them the ropes and instill confidence. Even with Doug Collins with Michael, Doug had supreme confidence in Jordan, which allowed him to be a better player. Phil and Mike gave let Pippen know that we have supreme confidence in you. We know once you become the guy you can be, we'll win championships. And that happened. And talking to him, like I said, lifting weights with him. Like they had the, um, what was the Breakfast Club? They haven't yep. touched on that yet. Um, the Breakfast Club thing with him, Robin, and Pippen. But that was Mike and Pippen before that. Mm-hmm. Spending time with him and just believing in him. And just slowly starting to give him more responsibilities. Like one, like I saw some posts and people was like, well, Pippen averaged more rebounds and assists and whatever in the finals. But Mike could have been a do-it-all, but he knew if I don't allow Pippen to have more responsibility and grow, I'm stunting his development. I don't need to be selfish to try to do everything. <clears throat> I, trust him to, I trust him to do that part. Like you can't have three guys doing the same thing. Yeah. And I think people kind of never bring that up. Like Mike was like, you know what? I'm going to let Pip run the, run the show. I'm going to play off the ball. You know what, Pip? You, why don't you guard so and so? He instilled that confidence that he like even with the Magic Johnson, like he stepped up to the table and Mike knew that he can do it because, like I said, I see this guy every day in practice. And then when the piggyback off what you were saying, as far as allowing Pippen to do it, it was only a couple seasons before where Mike averaged 37, 8, and 8 running point. He had triple double every time he ran point, so he's capable of doing it. But falling back and letting Pippen flourish, it made it a team even more deadly, man. And he definitely left, because there's plenty of games I've seen Jordan be like, yo, give me the ball, and Pippen like, nah, Mike like, dang. And he just chill and stuff like that. And Pippen go, nah, we gonna run the offense. So that that's confident. I mean, that's that's allowing Pippen to be him. And then eventually it stopped being like, Mike up here, Pippen up here, then it became a tandem, and there ain't nothing you could do about that. And so go, go ahead, uh, coach. You know, just, just hey. Pippen needed Mike at that particular time to grow. You know, we all know that. Uh, and, and, and Cardell, the people that say that Jordan didn't make anybody better, I mean, it's, 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 it's laughable. If you were there, if you saw what we saw, you know, it's, it's laughable. You know, to study the game. Uh, look at all the people that Jordan made better on that team, made them stronger, made them, you know, more conscious, made them leaders, made them, you know, more confident hitting that last second shot. <laughs> you don't make those guys, and got them paid too. Got B.J. Armstrong paid, yeah. you know. But what we forget about is it wasn't a whole lot of moving back then. So you had your core players, and they really stayed throughout their careers. You know, obviously, you know, Horace Graham moved on. It's not like, you know, today where every two years, you know, a superstar is moving or, you know, moving around. You got a whole bunch of – a whole different team. You know how we always see those stats of all-stars that Jordan played with, all-stars that LeBron played with, all-stars that Kobe played with. You know, the list goes on and on. It's it's only a handful that Jordan's ever played with, you know. They were – you know, people stayed on their – you know, on their team. So, to say that he didn't make anybody better, just don't look on the floor. Look outside, the, you know, the court. Don't look on just the court. Look in, in the weight room. Look in the film study. You know, look in the sidelines where Jordan was telling people, you know, you saw it in the clip tonight, you know, he was telling Robin, hey, if somebody screams, you know, do this, blah, 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 blah. He was telling Pippen, showing them, drawing up a play. Hey, those are, those are teachable moments that, you know, only a few can really do. So, you know, Jordan was – was <laughs> he made a whole lot of people better. Just ask them. So. And what did they do when they left the Bulls? A lot of them Oh, nothing. Hey, a lot, a lot of them disappeared. You know, a lot of them didn't – you know, they just didn't have it after that, you know. So, right. playing plan, plan with the GOAT, it made you better. Go ahead, Wilson. Uh, yeah. Um, look, man uh, – like you guys been saying, you know, Pip, 
for the pip that the the version of pip that became a top uh top 50 player all time doesn't happen without the lead dog over there it's not possible um and the other thing you got you know as you mentioned um he groomed his partner essentially right he, like you said it was batman and robin it went to just you know like it's just us and now you know one night you can give him you can give him whatever or scotty you going for three quarters i'm gonna fall back but this no i got the you know we got the red button if needed but to instill that type of confidence like it changed everything i, I think john Sully was saying like once we couldn't mess with scotty it was a wrap because like the level mike was again like psychopath normal people <laughs> normal people role player psychopath he brought the rest of them dudes, even the role players, to at least have a killer's type mentality. And then for them to stay on top the way they did, you had to have a healthy sense of paranoia too. You don't do that without a psychopath leading the way. And to get Scotty to that place, and I'm not saying Scotty's a caliber or a killer, but Scotty got to a place where it was Mike, and then that next tier, Scotty was in that tier with the rest of the league. Yeah, if you know what I mean, you know what I'm saying. Obviously, it's no brain. It needs to be said. Um, it wasn't like it was Mike, da 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 da, Scotty. Nah, because like like I think Raymond said, he peeled back. So he peeled back enough of his, so dude could keep climbing and climbing and climbing. Because again, if he didn't peel back, then the gaps like this, then you could throw other people from other teams in between them. You put it like this, and then everybody else is here. Hey man, that's that's that. That's how you end up with three peats. Man, I'm I'm really glad you brought this up because that's a this is an undervalued and underappreciated part of Mike's career. Like people try to use flimsy arguments. So Mike didn't get out the first round without Scotty. Well, when Mike got out the first round with Scotty, he averaged 45. So, I mean, Scotty was there, but we all know what the driving force was behind that. But to your point, Cardell, to see Scotty go from where he came when he first got in the league in such a short period of time to be the top tier level player he was, I mean, that just shows Mike, he, he put his DNA on that whole team. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's making players better. That's getting guys committed. That's leading by example. That's digging in people's ass when you got to, you know, and it's hard to receive that from somebody that's not putting in the work themselves. So, and Mike even said it, when he first got in the league, he was like, I'm just going to lead by example. And he did. And then when he got to a point where he had to be a little more vocal and started taking over that leadership and saying, hey, I got to get these guys on par with me or get, the, or get them to the next level, he did that. So if, if that's not making people better, I don't know what it is. Like trading for somebody that's been a sharpshooter all their life to be a sharpshooter on your team isn't making them better. That's just getting somebody that's done what they've always done. And just, like so, and just passing on the ball, that's not making them better. That just means you're unselfish, but that's their strength. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Go ahead, Arno. Um, one thing with the whole that debate, we're not going to mention names, but when Mike retired, the reason why the Bulls were still a good team is because under his leadership, they all learned how to win. They all learned how to be champions. He actually made them <laughs> better basketball players. And like no one, people use that against Mike, and I think it's ridiculous. Like, he made them better players. Pip has stepped up. Horace made an All Star team. BJ made an All Star team. All those guys that were on that that played with Michael, they stepped up because they learned how to win. They saw this man man in practice every day. And if he's going that hard, I got to go that hard. Well, I'm not going to be here. They had to take his verbal abuse because he's. Doing, he's, he's practicing what he preaches. He's walking it and talking it. So people like kind of never bring that up. Like there's a reason why those teams still did well because he made all those guys better basketball players. Great point. All right. He ain't just leave and go to other, let me be quiet. I ain't even gonna go there. <laughs> Make it about that look. We gonna stick to this uh, square. Last question. <laughs> they, finally, they finally get past the bad boys and the perfect guys right there. It's magic. The guy that he's one of the most championships, the most dominant team, Showtime, and they take him out of five games. Just talk about how it all came, it all built up to that point, and you just saw it all just come together at the right time against the right guy where you knew the shift had just happened. Just um, go ahead and talk about that. 
start with you, Ryan. Um, you know, when it when it was happening, of course, I didn't really fully grasp what was going on. I was like six or seven years old. But looking at it in retrospect, once they get once they got past the Pippin, uh the Pistons, the, the Lakers didn't stand a chance. Like once Mike cleared that hurdle of the bad boys, it was no way he was gonna not win a championship. And then of course it was it was against and it, like you said, it was a perfect storm. He's going up against Magic, a guy that he's often he was placed behind at that moment because he hadn't won yet. Like what? What more perfect way in his mind to cement himself than to beat the guy that people are often putting ahead of him, and just to know the kind of drive and the kind of player that Mike was, there, there, there was no way they were going to lose that series. Go to Arnold. Um, I think people forget how dominant Michael was in that series. Mm. Even though Magic did get him in foul trouble game one, and they made the switch. But Pippen, he was averaging like 33 and 11 assists. Like, that's crazy. And seven rebounds. It's shooting, it's shooting over 50%. Like, that's crazy. You know, and people try to, oh, well, Magic was old. Magic was MVP the year before. He was runner up this year. I'm not trying to hear that. He's all NBA first team. James Worthy was third team all NBA. I'm not trying to hear any of that. So, like, once again, that, yeah, they're trying to discredit Michael, like, and one thing I, I keep saying is the level of competition he played to get out of the East was better than anything LeBron James had to deal with. You, you said he said his name. Leave me alone. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I, had to, I, would, I had to say. I had to say. I would also I mean, like to point that out. <laughs> no, now this ain't against LeBron. LeBron's on the tape. This ain't against LeBron. It's about his some of his fans right. in the media. There were more players making All NBA teams in the Eastern Conference than the Western Conference during Michael's run. Mm-hmm. People tend to forget that. All NBA players, and at least each of them had at least two All Stars. I'm just saying, like, who's who's better, Dwight Howard or Shaq? Patrick <laughs> Ewan or what's the dude that played for Indiana oh, that went to Georgetown? Roy Hibbert. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, are we being for real right now? When when the <laughs> other guy was coming, when the oh, other guy was man. coming out, the, when the other guy was coming out the East, the Western Conference was having ten guys make the All NBA team. The Eastern Conference was only getting five. And two or three of those guys were on LeBron's team. That's all I'm saying. Man, look, no, we got to we got to dis- man. He's leading Cokehead to the playoffs in his first year. LeBron. So we got to we got to discredit the whole one era is stronger than the other era. And my, once Mike cemented himself and beat Magic, he never looked back. There's a lot of great players that we don't give enough credit to, enough um, love to, because they didn't win championships. They didn't win championships because of Mike. Yeah. Think of all the great shooting guards in the, during that era that didn't make the All-Star team, but were putting up numbers on winning teams. Now we have guys complaining about not making an All-Star team, and they go into the lottery. Ron Harper was number All-Star. Ron Harper had years where he averaged 25 and 5. I know I'm kind of going a little off point, but like, huh. like you know, like, yeah. like I said, once they beat the Pistons, like he was no looking back. It was like you beat the – once you beat up the bully on the block – Nobody's fucking with you. And that's what exactly what happened with Mike. Go ahead, coach. You know, you you need you need those robbery matchups in the finals. You know, you you had your I mean, even we were we've been actually blessed to see a lot of great matchups in the finals. You know, obviously, you know, uh 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 Wilton Russell, uh uh, you know, just just great matchups. And then you had the the magic and the birds, you know. It, and even the only thing that we, we never really had was LeBron and Cole. That's the only thing we never had. But we had the transition, LeBron and, and, and KD. So we've had those matchups before. And then Mike and, 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 and Magic, it was perfect. It was perfect. It was a new new leader on the block. It was a new king of the league. You know, everybody knew he was coming. He was there. You know, but he needed that hardware. So what's the best way to do it? Hey, I'm going to go beat the guy that has five championships already. I'm going to go beat the guy that they say is one of the top two or three players at the time, two, you know, players of all time. You know, I'm going to beat the storied franchise L.A. Lakers. And he did it, you know, and he, even after, you know, hey, I, I remember watching that game. I was a Lakers guy back then, too, worthy. I, I was a worthy guy. So, you know, just, um, you know, w- watching that series, you know, I remember after that first game, I was like, oh, they in trouble. After game two, I knew it was over. I literally knew it was over, you know, because what they did, oh, man, 
I saw it coming. It, you saw it. You saw an LA team that you knew weren't the. I'm not taking anything away from the Bulls, you know, but you knew that wasn't the same Lakers team from from you know eighty eight, eighty seven. Yeah, you. It wasn't that team. It wasn't Showtime anymore. Showtime was done. Showtime was done. You know, it, it was a new king on the block, and 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 Jordan took it, ran with it, and never gave it up. So. You know, hopefully, you know, the, the next couple of segments that we have uh, watching these, uh, you know, the last dance, oh, man, it's going to open up even more, you know, doors and windows that we didn't even see coming and we didn't know. So looking forward to it, man. All right, go ahead, Wilson. Yeah, man, um, it was a coordination. You know, not not to disrespect the Lakers or anything like that, but you got to think, man, the stuff them kids, speaking about the Bulls, the stuff they've been through, you know, with Detroit, some psychological type warfare type things they went through. The last thing they were about to do was let whoever, I, and I don't even think for the Bulls, like Magic, it could have been whoever in them jerseys, man. They didn't care. Like, like it was just one of the things where, like, we just got through what we came through, right? We ain't going back there. I don't care who we playing, whatever happens. And like Mike said, we ain't played good in, in game one. Everybody get all excited. It was like... Bruh, it's not like y'all gonna do what they did to us, and they can't do that to us no more. Like, like the 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 filter was officially off. Like, cause nobody else beat on them like that, right? Nobody did. They got past that. It was like, what are you gonna do? The worst you can do is beat on us. You can't beat on us like they beat on us, and we just swept them. You know what I'm saying? Like, like not swept, but we just got them out the way. So it was a coordination, man. And and like I said, I think that's where. So much credit. I again, so much credit to the Pistons for developing. Like they created that. Like like that's that's all kudos to them. So like, you can't mention you know the Bulls first three P second whatever. Can't mention the Bulls what they became without Detroit. Like if they don't go through that, like someone I forgot who it was earlier. I'm sorry. Like what's to say they want one to get complacent? That paranoia hit so hard because they're dealing with Detroit. Man, no, 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 no. And it honestly felt like that, like no matter, you know, like the media would build stuff up and people would build stuff up. But I think the Bulls were just playing against that that paranoia in the back of their minds. Like, we're not giving this up. No, no, we're not going back there. We're not going, we're not taking a step back down that hill. We're not giving any inches up of ground. Like, we're just not doing that again. Like, we passed that step and we're not going backwards. And I agree with you. And it's like um, you heard David Aldridge and a couple other media people at the time just say after they lost the first game, they thought it was over all, all, because you had magic. He had the winning formula. He went to, what, nine finals in the 80s? So it's just like you. It, that's what I mean by how the media didn't give you something until you actually did it, till you earned it. So it's like when you, it's, this guy won five rings and he just came in your building and beat you. You know, oh, no, you, you definitely don't have it. But what they understand that Mike and it were different. They weren't going forward this time. So, like he said, they were optimistic. They were like, oh, he had a good clutch three, and we didn't even play well when they barely won. Oh, we got them. And then they literally just won four straight and just got them about the way. And one thing I, I feel like with the Bulls, they don't get enough credit with it, especially in that first three-peat when Mike and Pippen were younger. But it still carried over. But when they were in a physical prime, which their defense, they harassed the hell out of Magic. Like, Magic – couldn't even like get going a lot of times. He couldn't even find guys because even though Pippen was on him or Jordan was on him, if he made the wrong pass, they was in the passing lane still in the ball coming back. And, and it was just like he found himself back on defense so quick and it was just relentless. And, and, and I know they about to get into it with uh, Johnny Bach, the other assistant coach came up with on the defense, man, the Doberman defense. <laughs> That's what I feel like was the biggest part of their championships because they could hold you down, man. Like it, it, it was hell dealing with them. And that's a half court trap. Yeah, and I, and I feel like that's what really they took from the Pistons mostly is not just being mentally tough and physically tough. Yo, we gonna make sure defense is always there and to carry us. There's gonna be times we can't make shots. You know what I'm saying? And that's gonna carry us over these other teams where when they can't make shots, their defense kind of flimsy. That's the time we could just crush them. And um, that's what you kind of saw coming together, coming together with the, uh, the 91 championship and then Mike being on top again, you know what I'm saying? So it's the beginning of the dynasty. And, you know, I'm excited to see where they go with it. You know, good to see Horace Grant. I was like, man, why they carry him? 
Oh, go ahead, Coach. Hey, one one thing with that, you know, that 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 first championship, you know, I even though they 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 went through Detroit, they had that monster, you know, th four year stretch with Detroit, who made the Bulls what they, you know, what they were. That first championship needed to be magic. It, it, it couldn't have been Portland. It couldn't have been Phoenix or, you know, one of the, uh, the Jazz. It, it needed to be magic. Yeah. It needed to be the star of the league, the passing of the torch. It had to be. So regardless of what they, you know, went through with Detroit, it was still magic. The player that he was, still was. Obviously, he, you know, lost a couple against Detroit, you know, uh, those back-to-back -back against Detroit. But magic was still the face of the league. Mm -hmm. you know, Jordan was there, but it was still that toggle. Who was the guy? Was it a superstar or was it a leader? He was still the leader. So he needed to beat Magic in the L.A. Lakers for it to take off. And that's exactly what it did, man. But um, Yes, it did. I appreciate having y'all on, man. This was a great discussion. Um, right, thank you. See you. Next week. Thank you. All right, no problem, man. Uh, we'll see y'all soon. Yes, sir. All right, All fellas. Right. All right, man. Bye, y'all. Later.